So we have the Holonomy representation. Fundamental theory. Well, we start with the subspace is called is called invariant. So let, let this be a subspace of the tangent space. Holonomy invariant. I hope you have an intuition of what that must mean. The holonomy acts on that full tangent space. This is subspace. It means for it means H of V is contained in V for all H in the holonomy. So, by elementary considerations, because this group here is compact and so on, we can split this tangent space into a direct sum, a direct sum, we're talking about splitting and so on, uh, maybe M here, of holonomy invariant spaces, which can no, uh, uh, so homo, holonomy invariant, decomposition with VI irreducible. In other words, you can't split the VI anymore. Remember this morning I talked about these, these things, you, you might have an invariant subspace, but you won't have a complement. But in this case, this group is sitting inside a compact group and this allows us to completely split this thing. This is completely uh, reducible, so we can do this. This is an elementary fact about compact groups. This is very elementary. You can split it. You have an invariant thing. This guy is operating by orthogonal transformations. The orthogonal complement is therefore invariant, and so on. Right? That's how you do it. Okay. So that's an interesting thing. You have this one tangent space which splits into, uh, 
the very suspect. It's true. What's not trivial is this gives a splitting of the manifold. Now I've lied to you a little bit because this splitting is at first only local. I'm going to tell you how you split the manifold. You, <laughs> yes, you, push, you start with one of these irreducible components and you push out in that direction of that irreducible component. And, you, and at, least locally, at least locally you get some product decomposition. The trouble is this is not well defined because of homotopy. It comes back on itself and so on. So if the manifold is simply connected, there's no problem with this. This is really a, a, a global theorem. So this is, this is global for simply connected manifold. Otherwise, it is local. Now, I hope you're happy. Because this is a mega reduction of the situation. We, in order to consider holonomy, metric considerations of curvature, we may assume that we're dealing with something that's irreducible because we split everything up into a product. Right? Yeah? You okay on this? Yeah. It's a wonderful theorem of Durand. Okay. It's called Durand the splitting theorem. It's not difficult. It's just the way holonomy is defined. It's defined by parallel transport. So you can parallel transport things out of this irreducible decomposition and get the man You just have to be careful. So it's a fundamental thing. So M is called irreducible. By definition, even though the uh, Splitting, only splitting uh, is the trivial one. I.e., <laughs> equals M1 and nothing more. Okay? Yes? Um. So when you say it splits into these other manifolds, are these, uh, no, when, when you say it splits, are M12 and M sub-manifolds, like what are these? Spot, you're asking a very good question. And I thank you very much because I, I think I had forgotten to make this very fundamental point. You would, they're manifolds. I mean, they're manifolds. However, this is a, this is a, this is a Riemannian geometry we're discussing here. If we're only doing this, you know, holonomy only needs a connection, right? Because it's just parallel transport, right? And this splitting does not split the connection, necessarily. That's what you're asking. Somehow, if, if this decomposition of the manifold really respects the connection in some way, it does not, necessarily. However, if the connection is a connection of a metric, so if it's, if it's, if it's uh, the levi chibi type connection, it does split it. Everything, if you have a metric here, instead of just a connection, everything splits. So, not only is it manifold, I don't know if that's what you're, they're really manifolds. Lo either local manifolds or, in the symmetric connection case, global. But, um, but the, so here, the nabla is the Medicivita. And that implies this is a, a, a splitting at the level of Riemannian geometry. And Riemannian now. Okay. So that is a big, big uh, help for everything, this implies, without loss of generality, we may assume that 
m is irreducible. Now back to Cartan. <clears throat> Cartan tried to answer Sandeep's question. I'm using Sandeep's question as a, as a guide to my lecture here. Tried to answer Sandeep's question. He said, Cartan said, these manifolds are too complicated. I can't handle it. I've got to find good classes of manifolds I can handle. Yeah. In nature, not a, ra a random manifold doesn't happen in nature. You want to find good manifolds that come from physics or other, other places, and you want to understand the mathematics. So, Cartan had a condition. Cartan's condition, Cartan's, let's say back to Cartan's condition, Curvature is invariant uh, under parallel transport. That looks like a very nice kind of manifold. You see, you believe with these wonderful coordinates that you follow a geodesic out that, along parallel transport, but curvature is going to be changing. I mean, curvature here and curvature there are going to be different in general. Right? So this is his wonderful condition, and it's just formulated this way, dr equals zero. Do you understand why, why it's formulated that way? Because it says d is the connection and it says parallel transport preserves curvature. That says the, the derivative of curvature with respect to the connection is zero. That's Cartan's condition. Modern for me means, for example, 2005. So that's, I think, somewhat modern. Okay. So, proves that Cartan's idea was incredibly interesting. <clears throat> Let's call this Cartan's condition. Uh, CC for Cartan's condition.
as above. And suppose that CC is not fulfilled. So there will be a dichotomy here. Either CC is going to be fulfilled, this good condition, we say curvature is parallel, it doesn't change by parallel transform. So suppose it's not fulfilled. Then, holonomy group, and it's enough to talk about the zero holonomy, it's equivalent, acts transitively. On the unit on the sphere, the unit sphere in the tangent space. So there's a dichotomy. Either the Cartan condition is fulfilled, or this thing acts transitively. That's a statement you can imagine. That's a statement about this holonomy group is somehow big. Right, right? Because it, it's big enough to act transitively on this sphere. Okay. Now, why is that good? Because of, of course, Borel. Borel told the, told these guys uh, about this formulation. It's a good formulation because Borel knows what groups act transitively. Okay. So I will write down now the groups that. Here's the, the table of the classification. So I'm going to make a table. Uh, well, you have uh, the full group O n uh, this is a group uh, the dimension of the manifold is n that's the full holonomy. This is a very typical thing. One class here is everything else. Right? This is the full possible, this is the full biggest possible holonomy you can have. In some sense, from the from all possible dynamics that's going on, this is the biggest mixing you could possibly have. Right? As you follow all this, you get it, you get every possible transformation of the tangent space by going out and around. Yeah. That's that's okay. So this is the generic manifold. Name. Generic. Okay. Here, if you have the special orthogonal group, that means determining one, it's still on the n-dimensional manifold, but of course, as you know, this just means that the manifold is orientable. Special orthogonal group has determinant one, and that means its, its action on the volume form is, is trivial because it acts on volume form with determinant. Okay. Okay. Next, UN. UN is the unitary group. 
you understand this? Which, which the isometries of the standard unitary uh, structure on C on C A. Okay. The manifold is the complex manifold you know about, so it's it's dimension is two. The, two n. And you'll be very happy to know that this is a k So very quickly, in the whole limit classification, you come into complex geometry. This is a big connection between complex geometry, real geometry, and mathematical physics. This is the first connection right there in the case. SUN, same dimension of manifold, it's a complex manifold. This manifold has a name. These manifolds are called Calabi-Yau manifolds, and they are Ricci flat. When you write flat, it means the curvature vanishes. Right? So this means the Ricci curvature vanishes. Okay. Remember this horrible Ricci curvature. It's this this trace trace of this trace thing, it vanishes, Rishi flat. Okay. Now I want to come back to Sandeep's remark. Kalabi, you see two names there, Kalabi and Yao. Both of these guys I know very well. Kalabi is already very old, but I, is, I haven't seen him recently, but I think he's doing fine. A wonderful Italian, uh, a wonderful Italian person, a wonderful Italian mathematician. Kalabi knew exactly how to find these metrics. Yes. He told Yao, he told Chern, and he told Yao, and he told everybody else in the business what you have to do to find these metrics. I'm coming to Sandy's point. Nobody could find them. Friends of mine struggled horribly with computations and failed and made mistakes. Failed. Following ideas of Kalabi. Yao, following ideas of Kalabi and of Chern, found these kalabi yau metrics. These things don't exist in some formula like some idiot writes on the blackboard. These things exist in some limit, in some infinite dimensional dynamical system. And Yao's contribution is called evolution equation. Yao's, Yao's contribution is to really write down the right equa evolution equation. You're solving something that is highly nonlinear. Highly nonlinear, it's called Mont Jampere equation. You're, high, you're solving something highly nonlinear, and you cannot solve it by just writing down some, some stuff. The only possible thing is to, to take, get it in some limiting way. Okay? So, this is what we were talking about at the dinner the other day. This is modern partial differential equations. Okay? You do not solve the partial differential equation by just writing it down, you solve it in some limiting way in some infinite dimensional space. This was Yao's idea, and Yao got Fields Award for this thing. Okay. For this one result. And it's a horrible, if you look at his paper, it's Invenzione's paper, take a look at it. It's really not fun to read. It's a lot of hard analysis. Okay. So just finding the metric is a huge thing. Now let me tell you, physicists were really interested in having this metric. Yeah? And the physicist will ask Yao, show me the metric. Nobody has seen this metric. The metric is unique, essentially. Essentially, given, given say, a K3 surface, this metric is unique. It's wonderful. It's, it's a unique thing. You take, this, you take the manifold, it's a four manifold. You take this manifold and you find this metric. It's almost unique. It's almost a one-to-one -one correspondence. It's wonderful. Nobody has ever seen the metric. No physicist has ever seen the metric. You maybe have some properties of this metric, you can see. But you cannot, have not yet been able to write down explicitly anything about this metric. It exists, but that's it. That's the problem in this subject. Okay? S, P, N. Well, this is four n dimensional. I hope you know <laughs> the symplectic group uh, acts transitively on complex, uh, well, on, on spheres. And you can actually have a symplectic group acting uh, with a little bit of a center uh, on spheres. Yeah. <clears throat> and 
These manifolds are hyperkähler manifolds. And they're Ricci flat. And hyperkähler means they're not only kähler with respect to one complex structure, they have two complex structures. And they're very compatible two complex structures. And they're very interesting manifolds. And again, to find these metrics is not a non-trivial thing. This thing is quaternionic. And it is not Ricci flat. It's not a, the Ricci curvature is, is a multiple, a non-zero multiple. Here the Ricci curvature is zero. Here it's a non-zero it's a non-zero multiple of the metric. Now you people in physics ought to know that's called an Einstein metric. When Ricci is a, a multiple of the metric, I mean the Ricci is a bilinear form. If you're lucky, it's positive definite. Right? Or negative this would be what it would be. Something, yeah. It's a multiple of the metric. Okay. I'm just making the list. The next one, uh, of course, is the exceptional group G2. And this is a very nice seven-dimensional manifold. And th these manifolds have become very important recently. And the, five, the last one is SO7, which, and this is acting as, uh, these are related, of course, to the Cayley numbers and, and things of that type. So, isn't that not? That's it. That's it. And it's very hard work to find any of these metrics. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, it's, it's even worse work to find parameter spaces of these metrics. Right? There's not just one metric. There's a whole parameter space of these metrics. Right? So there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, and this is a wonderful classification. Look, that is a complete list. Of course, you will say it's not so great because there's nothing special about the first thing. But even these things are very, very relevant for many subjects in mathematics and, and, and physics. These special things. These Einstein metrics, where did I say? Where, where, uh, this is, oh, this is called an Einstein metric. Okay. And we're still looking in complex geometries, we're still looking for some of these manifolds. Uh, for people who like abstract mathematics, we're looking for, sometimes in the so-called derived category. That means we, we, we don't look for the manifold explicitly, we look for cohomological manifolds. In other words, look for, for cohomology theories that fit the manifold we're looking for. That's how abstract this stuff gets to be in modern algebra. And that's a, that is Berger's theorem with an improvement by Jim Simons. And there are several modern authors, which I can, if you're interested in reading the proof, I can tell you about this proof. Okay? Again, the statement is either, either uh, Cartan is not fulfilled, either Cartan is fulfilled, or this guy acts transferred on the sphere, and here's what happens if it acts transferred on the sphere. This classification, I'm sure, is probably due to Borel. This is, for Borel, this is a joke. This is not serious. Okay. So, you've seen probably the deepest theorem I, uh, I've mentioned so far in this course, this Berger theorem. Okay. It really is a really theorem. Okay. Now, that says either Berger's list or CC. Yeah. Cartan was a genius. Cartan's condition is the equivalent to the following. And it is amazing that he was able to uh, it's just an amazing story. I, I don't know what sort of deep thinking he was doing at the time. Incredible. M G is a symmetric space. <clears throat> well, 
Let me write it carefully. It's a local circuit. That's the condition either locally, so if you make normal coordinates, that it's a local, this reflection is a local isometry, or if M is simply connected, this is global. So that means that there is a transformation, which is an isometry of the full space, which fixes the point and reflects geodesic. Time goes to minus time. Right? It's a very reasonable condition. That's the reason it's called a symmetric space, because it has these global symmetries. Okay, you're looking funny. You, is there a problem? Uh, yes, I can't. Let's talk about the problems. What's wrong? Yeah, I don't see how, uh, uh, why do we hope or why would we mean like, or does it mean that this transformation is an isometry. I don't know where your question is now. So, okay, so we have this map, T minus T. So if I have normal, normal coordinates that I talked about before, mm -hmm. I, can, I can easily define this map. Yes. T goes to minus T. Is it? Yeah, I can yes. define it. Okay, then you say it's an isometry. I'm requiring it to be an isometry. That is Cartan's condition. At every point, locally, geodesic reflection is an isometry. Okay? Okay. That is a very reasonable condition. It means that the geometry here and the geometry there is the same. Right? It, it looks like a reasonable condition. What? Yeah. Okay. The manifold, there are two possibilities. 
either locally or globally. You're requiring, I'm only, at first I'm only calling, calling this thing a symmetric, locally a symmetric space, is every point has a neighborhood so that that mapping is an isometry. Okay, so it's a local, locally symmetric space. Okay. If the fundamental group is trivial, this is global. It's very easy to see. You can extend these things everywhere. Here we go. Okay. Cartons can do so. We have universal cover. We have the manifold. Conditions satisfied here locally. Carton conditions satisfied here globally. On the universal cover. It's a matter on the universal cover piecing these things together. And it's just the fact you don't have any topology, you can really piece these things together. Okay, you can believe it. Okay. Okay. And now, again, you need a theorem. <clears throat> Proved sometime before World War II by various people. The isometry group of a Ramanian manifold is a Lie group. Acting properly. That's great. It's a, it's a Lie group, that means it's rather small. It's finite dimensional. You understand, if you have some just some random manifold, the group of transformations on that thing is going to be hard. But the isometry group is a Lie group acting properly. Okay. So here, if, if, uh, if the fundamental group is trivial, so in other words, if we can identify this with its universal cover, and CC is fulfilled, Then you can easily check the isometry group, which acts, which I call G, acts transitively. You can believe me. I, I, I flip here, then I flip here. I want to go to one from one point to another. I start making. Little, little reflections to go from one point to another. It's, it's pretty easy, you can imagine, right? You see, you, 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 right? you go here, and I, I want to go over here, so I first go here, and then I go here, and then I go here, and finally I land here by some sequence of reflections. It's pretty, pretty easy to believe that you get. And then you can prove it. Okay. Okay. That means, that means that M equals this Lie group yeah. modulo something that fixes a point where K is a compact subgroup. So I hope you see without thinking if if Cartan's condition is fulfilled. If it's not fulfilled, we have this list. If it is fulfilled, then we get into a very, very understandable situation. Okay? Okay. Now, I, I think it's a good time to quit, but with one mega remark. Okay? These things. Or I will explain. I have one block of lectures after this problem we're going to make, and I will explain the classification of these spaces. It's not difficult, okay? And but I want to want to make the one mega remark, which I hope will please you. Okay. That. M equals G mod K be a symmetric space.
and we can always uh, we can always keep, make it irreducible, so it's not a difficulty as above. And the whole anomaly you will see will be essential k. Okay. And p p zero be the point in M which corresponds to k. This is a unique point. Then there is a canonical decomposition of the Lie algebra of G to the K plus an orthogonal complement with respect to the canonical metric that's going on here, which is called the KP decomposition of this Lie algebra. You won't hate me because I'm going and doing all this stuff, but watch. The geodesics, the geodesics in M, so here is M, here's M, here is P0, and I'm interested in geodesics here, right? That's what I want to see. The geodesics are orbits of one parameter groups coming from P. Okay. The geodesics in M are uh, uh, through P, P0, are of the form X, so this is an exponential map, X of T, C times P0. That's an orbit of a one parameter group. It's global. T is global. This is not a local geodesic. It's as global as it can be. And C is in G. Now, you have no experience with Lie groups except definitions, I think. But this is a trivialization of the problem of finding geodesics. Okay? This is a trivialization of the problem of finding geodesics. Okay? And I will show you how to do that in the next lectures because this thing, I mean, is really going to be E to the C to the T C times P. There is an X, there, it will be E as a power series. It will be really E to an operator, a power series of the orbits of this stuff. We've been talking a bit with you about this. It is a joke, once you understand P, to write down these things, right? You would agree. You have to understand P. That's also a joke. This, this is, it, we're essentially, I mean, you, I think you will believe in complete generality this is a joke. And you just have to know the KP decomposition and you can write down geodesic. Yeah? And you can never write them down just as solutions of the, of the oil Lagrange equation. Never! Yeah? That's the point. And you reduce this thing to the most obvious thing of all. And, for example, in the sphere, you do this, and you write down these transformations, and they're great circles. Yes. In the disk, or up in the upper half plane, yes, that's, that's the other simply connected thing. Well, there's one of them, but also there are other ones. And they're circles which are perpendicular to the boundary. Yeah. This is completely trivial. Okay? And you have to understand, it took centuries for Lobachevsky and so on, and Gauss claimed he understood this at Bolyai and so on. It took them centuries to understand that there is a, is a, is a, a geometry of this type. Right? Yeah. So it is in some sense, in some sense, you, I, this is the main lecture for me actually. It's just, I, put, I want to put this in the context. Carton saw there was a dichotomy. Either you can compute wonderfully, or at least you have a complete list of holonomy. All of these metrics that you're looking to find, okay, on projected geometry, you can embed and so on, but really explicitly you can't do These are really hard to find metrics. Some of the manifolds are hard to find. Okay. So you reduce by this classification to very interesting list of things that you want to find. Okay. For example, these right here. 
or here, the Einstein method. Right? You can write down the Einstein equation. The Einstein equation is completely stupid. The Einstein equation is G equals, uh, no, the Ricci, Ricci equals the constant times G. That's the Einstein equation. I can write it down. You and I can do that. Yes? But you give me a manifold like that. Yeah? yeah that's interesting. a particularly global manifold. Maybe you can solve that problem locally. I'm not sure. But a global manifold. Yeah? It's non trivial. It's really non trivial. Right? And this was the genius of Cartan in the early part of the 20th century <laughs> to see this dichotomy between his condition, which says, which says curvature is parallel. It says parallel transport preserves curvature. And the minute you have this, you work, 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 and you have a reduction to a simple-minded question of Lie algebras. Yeah. So it's an embedding of this entire subject, at least that side of the subject, into the theory of the algebras. And very simple-minded of the algebras. It's not, nothing to do with it. Okay. The irony of this thing is that Cartan had already done a lot of classification work on the semi-simple Lie algebras that he wrote. <laughs> so he somehow knew in the background this had to be. Yeah. It's, almost, it's almost theological. Yeah. Okay, so I think we should talk. Thank you for coming today. And we're going to have this pause in now. So ask your questions and send me some files. And uh, we'll have some fun. And I'll be back with you then just before an exam period. And uh, okay, I think we're okay.